off this, what we believe will be a very fun and interesting day all about data. So first, I just want to welcome you to the third annual UC Libraries and IT at UC Day to Day. We want to thank you for your participation and for the sacrifice of your time. We do believe that the program that we've outlined for you today will be beneficial to you and something that you will definitely enjoy and take with you. Uh, so just some information about the layout of the room. There are, and we haven't gone already, there's some breakfast items over there, so some coffee and some water, and the restrooms are just beyond those tables there. So if you guys need to get up and take a bite break, a little food, water, energy, it's that way. Uh, without further ado, I just want to introduce to you Nelson Vincent. He is our Chief Information Officer here at the University of Cincinnati. So thank you. Maybe we'll joust. Um, several people have come out of retirement for this day. So something's got to be in the water. They come out of retirement, you know who you are I'm looking at you. Several people have said they're here because they're getting curious about what this is all about. And that was my friends from the uh, analytics program, the data program, and the London College of Business, which are great people to know. There's even some IT people here. Why are all these people here for day to day? It's certainly not to listen to a talking head like me. I've now been in UC long enough, I qualify as a talking head. So your job is to claim minutes back for me. Let me tell you how exciting this really is. We're at a time in, in this big UC where we're looking about what is our strategic direction going forward. Is analytics, big data, computational science an absolutely foundation to that, foundation to that direction? What's the answer? Louder. Yes. And you other folks who are going to vision and partner with all of us to make this real. And we're not talking about big computers or high performance computers, we're talking about the whole shoot and match. How does this ecosystem work? Well, it starts with the people sitting at the tables, the faculty, the students, the graduate students, and the researchers. You have to help us lead in this direction and get it right. This is a big challenge. This has not been part of our arsenal for a long time. A little history. So all this trouble started a while back when Shimo Wong called me up and said, you're not a member of the Coalition of Network Information of the American Research Libraries. What are we going to do about this? And I said, you're asking me for my checkbook? And he said, yes. So we got that out of the way really fast, and I found myself in D.C. at the National Conference of the about 138 research libraries, which led to all sorts of interesting and subsequent meetings. And we go all the time. We really have great conversations and community with those folks. The other person we directed to into this conversation, into this long dialogue, was the Vice President for Research. At the time, it was the wall. So we, we formed this trio, and we're still talking about this stuff, and we're still bringing people together. And we want action this time. More action than we've had, right? Is that fair? I think it's fair. We've got the talent right here, we can get this done. High performance computing, computational analysis, down where our colleagues live, which departments have all this going on, where are the students, where the, where's the grant money, where's the federal funding, where are the innovation folks we can work with. This is the time to get this done. So hopefully you get to know people you don't know. Where, where your friends are in this building is important. A great day, great weather, it's almost spring like in here. Meet some new people. Work out what this is all about. Is it about big data? Is it about analytics? Is it about big shiny metal boxes called supercomputers? Or is it really about a revolution in how we do research? What constitutes data? How we problem solve? What does it mean to have data driven decision making? And where do we fit? And how can we grow this capacity at the University of Cincinnati in the 21st century? That's it. Got the charge? If you have this coming along. It is my great pleasure to introduce the other CIO at the University of Cincinnati, the Chief Innovation Officer. To David Evans, who lives at 1819. Good morning. So, as Donald said, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer. This is a new position for the University of Cincinnati. Uh, President Pinto uh, created this position about seven months ago to really focus on and recognize that the pace of change is happening at unparalleled rates, and that we're going to have to learn as a university how to partner in some new and different ways. So one of the things that's created is something called the 1819 Innovation Hub, what I actually like to call the iHub, and it's within the Uptown Innovation Corridor, and this is located over by a physical place located by 
by the I-71 Martin Luther King exchange that just got, I think, the past summer uh, got put in. And so we're really, really excited about it because it's going to us, give us an opportunity for the community to truly connect with this university in a very different way. So organizations of all sizes, everything from Fortune 500 companies to Cincinnati Children's to UC Health, small and mid-sized organizations to startups are going to be able to connect physically with the vast amount of resources this university brings. So 45,000 students, the 6,600 faculty, all this research capability, this is going to be the physical place where collaborations, collisions are going to occur in this ever-changing world. And to put some perspective around the changes that are going on, think about the following. So I'm going to take this from the perspective of the amount of time it took to get to 50 million users. The telephone, and not the things you carry in the pocket, but for those of us who remember when these things used to hang on the wall, it took 75 years to get to 50 million users. Radio did it in 38. TV did it in 13, the internet did it in 4, and Angry Birds did it in 38 days. <laughs> so what's important about this is we're connected in a way we've never been connected. And we're connected at a speed, the ability to connect with others at a speed that we've never seen before as well. So Eric Teller, who's nicknamed Astro, who's a computer scientist from Carnegie Mellon, who happens to be the CEO of r and arm of Alphabet, which is a parent organization of Google. He says that about 2007, which if you recall, 2007 is about the year when these came out. 2007, he says that the pace of change has exceeded our ability as humans to comprehend. Now think about that. He indicates that the pace of change happening in society today is happening at a rate we can no longer as individuals comprehend. So what does he say? He said, we've got to learn to partner. We've got to learn to understand our strengths and how we connect in very different ways with others. Just as a side note, if you think about this device, I, I grew up in the software industry. I still remember, we talked about it last night with Dr. Brennan. We were talking about the old punch cards that happened on the IBM 029 machines, if anybody remembers. I, I do, because that was one of my engineering classes early on. But this little device, if you think about just the storage capability, the processing speed and the transmission speed, if you were trying to acquire this device 20 years ago, this would have cost you approximately $13 million. And now we're here in our pocket. So think about that. At the core of all of this is what? Data. Data is everywhere. And what's interesting about data, data has always been around, but data is new and ever evolving. I think about this little device that I have on my arm, it's hardware colliding with technology and information and innovation in ways we've never seen. What's also interesting is we're at the very beginning of this. And it's not just about the data from a historical standpoint. So this tells me how far I walked, my heart being part of this. But think about the opportunity to use the data to predict what the future or what problems may need to be solved. So we had an exciting conversation with Dr. Brennan. I think you're in store for, for a very interesting uh, conversation today. And I think this is the core of everything, the foundation of everything we're going to do. But before we get there, I want to introduce the Dean and Head of Art Library here, Chimo Webb. Welcome everybody. I'm very pleased for the turnout today and the weather is good as well. Uh, before I mean, introduce today's keynote, uh, Dr. Brenna, I'd like to thank the people from the both IT and the library organization who worked so hard uh, to put this uh, wonderful event uh, together. I'd also like to take this opportunity to say a few words about what the data means to the UC Library. This December, UC Library were awarded a huge grant, almost $1 million, from the Andrew Menon Foundation sponsoring a project in exploring machine learning and data visualization in the digital humanities and the social science area. However, throughout this grant project, we also like to uh, explore and expand our scope of the data collaboration 
with most of the UC STEM field colleges and research units. UC Library's vision, as you are aware, is become a globally engaged intellectual commons or hubs of the university. That hub includes cross-university partnership in connecting, utilizing, and curating enterprise-wide research data. Being a data survey today has become a new literacy for the researchers, and the learning data analytics is part of the core mission or dimension of learning object, objectives for all our students. Data now is being referred, as you are aware, as the new natural resource to industry and countries, and it's, it's, it's become extremely important for any of the organization's competitive advantages. Today, our library, uh, particularly UC Library, under our strategic planning, has become the front runner in the research data management. As I mentioned, we acquire, organize, and disseminate and preserve the data. We are also enter into the new areas such as data and analytics with our partnership with other research units. Libraries are given the new titles like the information list are increasingly trained for the new knowledge and the skill sets for research data management and the data and analytics. It is not an overstatement. If the natural resource in the 19th century Industry technologies in the 20th century were the keys for countries and industries' advancement. Nowadays, data will hold the most promised future for every organization and country's competitive age for the 21st century. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce you today's keynote speaker, Dr. Patricia Flatney Brenner. Dr. Brenna is the pioneer in the development of information system for patients. She helped develop new ways for effective visualization of the high dimensional data and led an initiative designed to stimulate the next generation of personal health records. Dr. Brenna is currently the director of the National Library of Medicine the world's largest biomedical library and the producer of the digital information service used for scientists, health professionals, and the members of the public order around the world. She assumed this directorship in the August of 2016. As the January of 2017, Dr. Brenna also serves as the NIH Interim Associate Director for Data Science. Dr. Brenna served as the president for the American Medical Informatics Association, was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Science, and is the fellow of the American Academy of Nursing and the American College of the Medical Informatics and the New York Academy of Medicine. It is my great honor to have Dr. Brenna to be our keynote. Thank you. Tiffany? You'll have to pardon us for a moment, but the audiovisual opportunities in this room were a little bit unexpected, and one of them is she has to turn my microphone on for me. <laughs> So what you, I want to thank Dr. Wang for the invitation to be here. Thank you so much. We're good friends now. Uh, <laughs> me and, and Andy are also, actually. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to be here. Shimo has been um, an important and significant contributor to the National Library of Medicine's efforts in setting our strategic plan, so we will, you'll be here, which you'll be hearing about this morning. I also want to be very, very acknowledging of, of Dr. Vincent's introductory remarks this is your job to figure out. So I am here, as I hope, a stimulus to help you think about that. But don't get too comfortable, because you got some work to do, even in the next hour, to get us going in this area. 
I'm happy to be here as part of your federal investment in the future of data science. There is a significant federal investment across all of the federal agencies in how we're going to both protect and secure data for future uses, as well as ensure we get the value from this data. So you'll hear me talking today about protection as well as promotion. I also have quite a selection of slides and videos, and I'm a little bit worried about the display. Those of you in the front row, you might want to take a seat a little further back because your necks are going to be craning for some of this. Um, let me begin, though, by asking you to take a minute and talk to the person next to you for one minute. What do you want to know in an hour that you don't know right now about data science, about the future of the National Library of Medicine, and about your role in it? Talk about yourself. Thirty seconds. Okay, stop. Wow. I'm the second eldest of ten children, and I can tell you that never works at home. <laughs> um, what do you want to know in an hour? You should be thinking yourself, what do you want to give at the end of that hour because you've learned something. Because we are here today to talk about the transformation of data into knowledge, and then that transformation of knowledge into health. The fundamental reason why the NIH cares about data science cares about big data, cares about what the librarians are bringing to the future with metadata, with curation, with effective access to information, is because fundamentally we believe that data-powered health is the future of the United States and the world. And it is accelerating the opportunities to drive data-powered health that the National Library of Medicine is committed to. Let me give you a vision of what data-powered health could look like. The National Library of Medicine alone is not going to make data-powered health happen. We actually do very little to cure people. We don't have any big discoveries to brag about, but every single biomedical discovery worldwide has been touched by NLM resources. So we view ourselves as the engine for the development of data-powered health in partnership with the National Institutes of Health and across the world. So today I'm going to be doing three things with you. I'm going to, and then you're going to be doing something for me. First, I'm going to talk to you about what I believe data-powered health is and what it's going to bring. Second, I'm going to have you position the library in a new way. We chatted a little bit yesterday. When, the, when I was first appointed the director of the National Library of Medicine 18 months ago, the first thing my colleague said is, change that damn name. It's so old-fashioned. We don't like that anymore. Well, you know what? The National Library of Medicine has great cachet. Our reputational value is so important. I'm not touching that name. 
I kind of like that name. But what I'm going to do is get into your brain and change what library means to see it as a launching pad for the future. And the third thing I want to do is to show you a couple examples about how the NLM fosters data powered health and what I think we'll be bringing to researchers, to clinicians, and to patients. This is important. Now, as we go through this, it's important for you to begin to think about what health means in your life and how you intersect with that. You may be a patient, you may be a parent, you may be a clinician, you may be someone whose research won't touch the health sector for 20 years, but because of what you are doing, we will know better in 20 years what to do. Think about where you touch the health of the world and the health of individuals. As I think about data-powered health, I think of this being, next slide please, I think of this as a pathway to knowing more about people because we know things about them at a very granular level and we have the ability, the analytics, the tools to integrate that. So all that we know by sight and sound and touch is now complemented by deep understanding of data. Next slide, please. The data-powered health touches people all over. Next slide, please. The first thing I want you to be thinking about data-powered health is that this is a possibility of linking trusted health information and the electronic health record data. This we've waited 30 years for, those of us who've been in the medical informatics community. That EHR is going to serve not only understanding the care in the moment and recording and getting the billing right, but it's going to serve knowledge building. Next slide, please. The data-powered health vision that I hold for the world also thinks about learning from the processes of care, bring knowledge to the point of clinical decision-making. So the data-powered health is not something that only goes on in a laboratory, but it completes the virtuous cycle into the action of clinicians. Next slide, please. Data-powered health means things that focus on the in-the-moment experience of health, the capturing the data and delivering actionable moments back to the point of living. Let me say this once, and I will say this several times today. Patients are not unpaid data collectors. We need to give them something for the data we want to get from them. We need to partner with them. So as we think about data-powered health, we want to think about the fact that we can know more in the moment and so can the person who's giving us the data. Next slide, please. Data-powered health subs fundamentally has the ability to do what we've desired for years, to link public health, community-level genomic understanding to help us know more about not just me and my body, but who I live next to and who I live down the street from, and how, whether it's the water quality or the amount of traffic outside my house, affects my health. This will require our researchers to have very broad questions. Data-powered health begins with the questions and curiosity of researchers and the engagement of clinicians. Next slide, please. Data-powered health fundamentally will help us understand the experience of everyday living and link it to biological knowledge. Now, we've done pretty well so far in the last 15, 18 years with getting genomic data, at least wrangling it into a functional structure that we can do something with. We now have this enormous challenge of the everyday experience. How does walking, conversing, singing, being with my family link to my sense of health? How does my mother's metabolome affect mine? What happens when I'm in a new environment, in a new world? Understanding this not only through self-report and clinical investigation, but through sensors and monitors may help us understand and act more in a more timely fashion. Next slide, please. And finally, data-powered health will give us a lifespan approach to understanding health and data. We thought initially when that human genome was being mapped, we could just find the map and we'd know your life. And then we found out, oops, we were wrong. But it gives us a clue to your life. But what we learned, it's really important to understand the rest of your life along the way. Data science is not just about bioinformatics. It's about understanding how many times a mother steps up and down when she lifts her child. It's about knowing to what extent is stress causing a functional change in the body at a moment. Data-powered health is the ability to understand person through information. Next slide, please. Now, scientists have a very specific role in this, and that is to fundamentally, next, there we are, to recognize that data-powered and data-driven discoveries arise from and inform health care and health practices. The many other federal agencies are investing in data-driven discovery. We invest in it because we think it has an endpoint in health. That doesn't mean every researcher has to be in the clinical area. It doesn't mean only clinical questions are relevant. But what it does mean is that as a leader, part of the leadership of the NIH, I must be thinking with my colleagues every time we invest in data, will this get us closer to health? Secondly, 
we, data-powered health gives us the possibility to integrate science across many time scales. The possibility of understanding not simply a phenomenon in situ, <coughs> excuse me, in isolation, but actually in its fuller context. So we can understand not only this particular genetic structure, but where it came in this particular person's life and what the body is experiencing through that life. We can look at many time scales. The promise is there for this. I have to tell you, the analytics aren't quite there yet, but we're getting to them. Data-powered health is fundamentally invigorated by investigator imagination. Investigator imagination, asking the right questions, is the starting point. Don't wait for the data set to appear and think, I'll look around in here, see if there's something interesting. Our data sets are too big. You're going to waste too much time exploring. I know the KDD people, from the knowledge uh, discovery through data people from 25 years ago thought if we just had the data, it would tell us the secrets of life. And i got to tell you, it's going to mislead us a couple of times. And it might tell us some things that aren't worth knowing. So we must, in my, thank you, we must, in our process of understanding data power health, Remember, it is investigator imagination. This university and universities like this across the country that stimulate young people, that foster the development of researchers, that enter into dialogue in the classroom are the starting point of data-driven health, data-driven discovery and data-powered health. It's important to recognize as we move into 21st century data-powered health that we're moving from data obtained under controlled conditions like a wonderful sequence analysis is going to be complemented by clinical data and patient-generated data. And let me tell you something. Patients do not use formal terminology when they talk about their health. Patients tell us what they think and they feel in words that make sense to them. We will, as professionals, need to build the bridge between a person understanding of health and a, pre and a, a clinical and a biological and a research understanding. We can no longer rely on the dominance, the preference, the privileging of scientific knowledge as being the only way to get towards data-powered health. We have to enter into conversations. We'll come back to them because I'm going to be asking you about how we'll do that in a few minutes. And finally and fundamentally, I want you to think about data contributors, patients and research participants, must benefit at the point of data capture as well as from our discoveries. Like many of you, I have written that line in my human subject consent form. Participation in this research will do nothing for you, but it will help society, so thank you very much. Maybe you never wrote that, but I wrote that a lot. Now, we can't do that anymore. We can't ask people to give without getting something back, and we need to tighten that cycle. And we have many more opportunities to do that because of these things that sit in our pockets, because of and recognition across society that data drives us in directions that are good, sometimes misleading, but good. Uh, next slide, please. Data-powered health fundamentally rests on an end, a secure end-to-end -end pipeline of data flows. And this means that we don't just get to be health data. We got to ride on the same thing that Verizon and Netflix is riding on. This whole conversation about net neutrality right now is really important. And if you're not up to speed on it, please go home and read about it. Because it means choices about how we'll be able to acquire the resources, the knowledge, and the deliver the services under a data-powered health model may be controlled by someone outside of our sphere, may be controlled by a, a, a community whose, whose incentive structure is different than ours. Participating in conversations that intersect with other data models is part of our data-powered future. Data-powered health will be driven by the experience of the individual, the experience of the clinician, large data banks, mostly in the cloud now. This is one that scares me a little bit. We'll come back to that scare in a moment. But also biological inquiry and clinical practice. We have lots of players in the game. Never before in the history of discovery has there been such a tight link between knowledge building and knowledge using as there is and can be and should be in the future. I have great hopes for data-powered health. I have a 24-year-old son. I anticipate I'll be a grandparent someday, not yet. And I want that grandchild to have the benefits of what I can envision today. It will only happen if we disrupt many things. And the first thing I'm going to ask you to disrupt, next slide please, is where we think care happens. I want to present to you a concept called the care between the care. Take a look at this line. It represents a year in a patient's life. That person has a fracture. They go in the hospital. They get surgery. They get rehabilitation. They get counseling. They get medications. They go home. They get better. Most people get better in our healthcare system right now. But take a look at those vertical lines, the little skinny lines. That's where all the action in medical informatics has been for the last 25 years. 
inside the hospital. But the red lines depicting the space between is where people live health and where they experience health. And that's where data-powered health is going. For us to be there, we must have good libraries that can both understand, hold knowledge, and explain what that knowledge looks like. So I joined the National Library of Medicine three years ago, two years ago, sorry, excuse me, I made the decision a little bit earlier than that. And this, here you see a picture of our beautiful building in Washington, D.C., or in Bethesda. Uh, the low building in the front is the original building. The high building on the left is our research tower. But I want you to think about the National Library of Medicine. From my perspective now, what I'm bringing to it uniquely is I am the first nurse to direct the National Library of Medicine. I am the first industrial engineer to direct the National Library of Medicine. And I'm not a librarian. And I'm in trouble with that sometimes because you librarians know stuff that I really don't know. But what does this bring? What does this mean for the future of data power health? It means first and foremost, I bring to this understanding a knowledge of the human condition that is unique to nursing. Next slide, please. I bring, first and foremost, could, next slide please, the Virginia Henderson's comment. Virginia Henderson is up in the upper left-hand corner, beautiful woman, recently deceased. She was a very famous nurse and she said nursing should support people for what they could or would do unaided if they had the knowledge, the strength, or the will. Nursing fundamentally deals with the human response to disease, disability, and development. Our physician colleagues deal with pathologies and the promotion or avoidance of illnesses. Our behavioral health science colleagues deal with the experience of the mental and translating mental into physical behaviors. We as nurses bring a different perspective and I joined the National Library of Medicine because I wanted the definition of health to be broadened to include the human response and to have the tools in place to do for that person what they would do unaided if they could. Not to do it for them no matter what. So we are a fundamentally supporting a health perspective that says engage with the other. Uh, next please. Um, Joe Leiter, who is the second person in here, um, was an early director of the National Library of Medicine and brought a, a particular library of um, resources. And he said in the 60s, automation is coming. Well, yes, of course. But he said, it's not our job to build collections. It's to build services. The library exists because it provides services. If we simply gathered a bunch of things and put them on the shelf, we would not be useful. We would not be able to mobilize society. We would not be able to touch discovery and create data-powered health. Next click, please. Another famous nurse in the lower right-hand corner, Hildegard Pepla, who is a psychiatric nurse, said, we want to consider the clues to large-scale automation and their impact on our society. She said that in 1962. She said, we need to be thinking about this. Now, the nursing people who are in the audience know how long it's taken our field to embrace this. And the physicians, we think, will come along soon, too. But fundamentally, <laughs> what we recognize is that when you have taken a human service profession where the knowledge embedded in the individual and the therapeutic use of self has been important and say, now we're going to put data on top of that, it can make a disruptive experience for those clinicians. And we, as professionals, that it, they sit at the intersection between data, health, and professionals, and society need to help with that transition. Uh, next slide, next clip, please. Um, and finally, uh, Ina Mathenson, who is the, the beautiful woman in the lower left-hand corner, she said we, that librarians must be tool builders and system developers and solvers of problems. So I hope you're coming along with me, putting that new sense of what is library in your mind. We are now launching, we are 19 years away from our, the beginning of our third century at the National Library of Medicine. We grew up as a, from the beginnings in a small army field hospital where a surgeon wrote to the director of the army and said, I need some books to help me. Now we have 26 million citations, 5 million full text articles, 2 million books, and we touch every part of the globe that lets us in. Um, let's go and take a look at what our strategic plan is, is looking forward. After a year and, and, 12, and six months, next slide please, of conversations with hundreds of people around the country, around the world, we identified a strategic plan for the National Library of Medicine that res respects our traditions and forces us into a future that we're kind of ready for. Three pillars of our strategic plan. First, we want to accelerate discovery and advance health through data-driven research. We are a part of the National Institutes of Health. The National Institutes of Health is a $35 billion a year research enterprise. So fundamentally, our first step is to work with our colleagues in science to accelerate discovery, but also connect into improving health. Second, we need to reach more people through way, in new ways through enhanced dissemination and engagement. 
No longer is it enough to put up a website and hope people will come and take a look at it, even if it's a great website. And I have to be very honest, some of ours aren't designed as good as I would like. We have to bring new, yes, <laughs> somebody's looked at something. That blue line makes me nuts. We have, yeah, the, and those of you who've seen the National Library of know we have this, this sort of steel blue all through our, our logos. It's changing, we've got new things coming up. But we have to reach new people in new ways. No, my son is 24 years old, he Instagrams me. Instagram, I can't spell the word. What do you mean Instagram? Can you just talk to me on the phone? No, it's, you'll like to see this. So I'm beginning to like it. I can adjust, but we have to reach people on the move. We cannot lose reflective thought. We cannot lose the deep investment that curious researchers make as they sift and winnow, as we would say in Wisconsin, understanding what's going on. So we have to go from our scientists to our citizens and everywhere in between. And we have to do it in new ways. And like everyone else, with less money, with fewer workers, with greater regulation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've got great opportunities. And finally, we need to build a workforce for data-driven health and research. So I'm going to give you some, a little more detail on each of these now. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. To accelerate discovery and advance health through data-driven research. Accelerating discovery is important. I'm not sure that we've got, do we have any humanists in the room here? Do we have some of uh, the people from the, not, not, not only that I can see, or none that will admit it. Um, I, what I want you to understand is discovery is not only what we do in the laboratory with the science, but it's also what our colleagues who are hermeneutic or use more interpretive methods in their interaction with people. We need a range of discoveries that we must support. Um, next slide, please. Fundamentally, how the National Library of Medicine supports this is to create an ecosystem, collecting the research resources of a digital research enterprise. What you see in this sphere here are small blobs that say code, library, clinical data, study data, pathways. These are all components of the research project. What you should be paying attention to here is the arcs between them because what the National Library of Medicine's sweet spot is, is the arcs, is the connection, is the creating the structure. We do work to help that within each of those blobs there's standard terminologies, there's appropriate metadata, there's position, excuse me, uh, access control. There's a range of things that have to be there. But lots of different people can do that, but what no one else besides a librarian can do is to think about the inter connections. And some of those will be interconnections through human connection. Some of them will be through, inter, through existing electronic connections. Some of them will be through new discovery models that we've yet to figure. But fundamentally, what we are building at the National Library of Medicine that will be the platform for discovery is a, a digital research enterprise with its elements connected. Next slide, please. As part of our creating the digital, the, 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 the pathway toward the future, we must advance research and development in biomedical informatics and data science. Nobody else at NIH is going to invest in this. I can tell you right now, it, this is our science, the science of information. What we need to do in this area, particularly, are to increase our extramural programs in our universities and research centers around the, the country and our intramural programs. And we need to move in two important directions. One is increasing our use and our, our, our development of, of general re reproducible scalable analytics. Right now many of our analytics are driven by a, and inspired by a problem, a clinical problem or a research problem. They don't scale to other problems so we don't know where they can be moved. The National Library of Medicine's investment is in scalable, reproducible, sustainable analytics. Second, we must improve curation and dissemination. No longer can we have 150 indexers, subject matter experts, touching each, and each article as it comes through. We ingest a million articles a year. So we must move to automated pipelines. We must move to integrated synthesis delivery. There's lots of research that can and should be done. We will do some of this in partnership with our colleagues across NIH, but we will retain and grow our intramural and extramural research programs. Next slide. We have the opportunity, we have the, the, the uh, I'm sorry, I'm off. Could you back up one slide, please? It's always a mystery here. All right, um, no, go ahead, next slide. We have the opportunity to examine, to find new ways by using images in better fashions. We have provided at the National Library of Medicine the, uh, the biological and genomic databases that led to the first studies that led to the CRISPR-Cas mechanism. We have the ability at the National Library of Medicine to stimulate, because of our researchers, new kinds of taxonomies that allow us to grow and better understand what the relationship in the One Health model is between the, uh, the non-human uh, organisms and human organisms. Next slide, please. And we would continue to be investing in those areas. 
We also will be continuing to invest in data science and a data science strategy that actually is driven by the imagination of our investigators. The imagination begins the process of discovering new analytics, discovering new algorithms. It is not the end point, and we must foster this imagination to the extent that we can by increasing our investment both in training as well as in research opportunities. Next slide, please. I envision us also having a strong and important emphasis in fostering open science and policies and practice. The National Library of Medicine is responsible for the NIH as being the site for open science, and we have already been leaders in this area. Since 2004, we've had our public access PubMed Central Utility. Public access utility means that, that information from research projects that are funded by the federal government are available immediately to the public as full text review. We now have five million articles in this area. But open science is not simply about putting your science in at the end of the process. Open science means beginning at the beginning of the process to think about what data are available. How do I document my, pro my pipelines and workflows so they can be shared by others earlier? How do I engage others in the conversation? This is a whole new game changer. In the past, a researcher got to hold everything very, very tightly until that last piece of knowledge was wrangled out of that data, even though it was 20 years ago that I collected it. It's still something good in it, and you can't have it. Gone. Wrong. Can't do that. Too expensive. We can no longer use data collected once for one purpose. We must use data collected once for multiple purposes, and the strategies for do that come under an open science policies and practices. Once you get beyond open science is good, which none of you can argue against, what's the second sentence? How do we actually do that? How do we balance intellectual property and open science? How do we balance patient privacy and open science? These are things we must build through collaboration and conversation. Next slide, please. We will not be able to accelerate the future of data science and data-driven discovery and data-powered health without a sustainable infrastructure. So the NLM is assisting the NIH right now in creating a federated data commons model. When Phil Bourne was here a few years ago, you might have heard some of the discussion about this work and how they were envisioning this. Well, it's now almost a reality. We envision that the National Institutes of Health will stand up its own data commons, and part of that data commons will be a repository for data generated in the course of federally funded research. Not every data element and not in perpetuity. So we have many policies to set up. How do we decide? what's important, how do we decide how to retain, who pays for this. Every conversation at NIH actually doesn't get done until that sentence of who pays at least gets put on the table. The future of data science, the future of data-driven discovery is bigger than the National Library of Medicine. So when I first got there, I was told by a number of people, oh, well, we'll just move the data into NLM like we move the literature into NLM. Wrong. Not for lots of reasons, including the fact, librarians in the room, collection management. We know how to systematically decide what to acquire. So we will bring the skills of library science to the conversation about identifying high-value data sets and preserving them in ways that make them accessible to individuals. We will also, though, recognize that there's going to be lots and lots of data repositories. There already are around the country. Cloud instances, commons, where they exist across NIH even with our our uh, cancer genomics data set, we have a number of opportunities within the new All of Us program, which is our million person cohort model that will have its own data repository of a very different type. The questions about creating data repositories force us to look at what constitutes a complete data set. What is the final data set from a, from a study? Can you keep two of them, like your own and the one you give to the feds? Prefer not, but maybe so. How do we decide what kinds of Cloud storage is safe enough to ensure single copies of data. Where do we place analytics so that an individual investigator in the future, whether it be a citizen scientist or a biomedical scientist, can find data and operate on that data in a cloud in the most cost-efficient manner possible? Many, many questions are being addressed here. Our first approach in the, in the NIH Data Commons is to bring three high-value data sets, the TopMed data set, which is a cardiovascular data set, including the Framingham data set, genomic data, and also image data, TopMed, GTEx, the genome to tissue data set that was set up through the Common Fund to map a, subs a small set of very highly specific functionalities, and then the model organism data sets, model organisms being a non-human set of data of, of um, 
structures that allow for investigation and interrogation of both genomic performance as well as drug discovery. Examples of the model organism data sets include the worm and the fly basin, um, the zebrafish, there's a, there's a lot of them. And all of these require us to take on issues of identity and access management, proper storage, the reputable copy of a data set. And so we're in the process. We are on a journey. We hope you'll come on that journey with us. Next slide, please. While we're building the inside of data-driven discovery, we have to be reaching outside. We are, after all, a library. Now, we're not a lending library, so we're not the kind of library that you deal with here at the Health Science Center or downtown. But we are a library that holds, by law, holds the knowledge of medical profession and makes it accessible. So we make it accessible by digitizing a lot of our information. We make it accessible by supporting access to and pointing to information. We have to consider how the different ways we engage with more people through dissemination and, and our new strategies of engagement. Next slide, please. So the first thing is we have to know who our users are. And on the left, you see users that you probably won't be too surprised. Surprise. Biomedical scientist, patient, clinician, health policy worker. But on the right, you're going to see one, some that maybe are a little surprising to you, that historians are increasingly interested in our resources. Lawyers want to know us. Investors are curious. Can we determine the pricing, the proper uh, place of investment? So as the National Library of Medicine identifies its user, we have to get rid of the white coats and the biological scientists and the poor sick person in the bed and start to think about a whole lot of other people. And I will tell you right now, they're not all sure we're here. I mean, I have to knock on doors and say good morning. The conversations like we had with David last night is one of my ways for letting industry know the National Library of Medicine supports our outreach. But we also have our national network of libraries of medicine, librarians in counties all over the country who work with local businesses, who work with local legal issues. And so we have to, we are already making some forays into our new partnerships, our new patrons, but we have to continue to do that. Gone is the idea that we had two or three patrons, personas that we could design for. Our interfaces now have to be robust enough to design for a plethora of people. Next slide, please. This is one of my most important slides to present to you. We must foster the distinctiveness of the National Library of Medicine as a reliable, trustable source of health information and biomedical data. We must foster the effectiveness and distinctiveness of the National Library of Medicine as a reliable, trustable source. This means three things. It means an investigator needs to know when they take down a data set, whether it's a genomic data set or one of our environmental assessments, that they can trust that it's been properly curated, that it's been properly vetted, that the intellectual property rights and the human subjects rights are being protected so that they can go on with their science, trusting that we have provided them with a trustable resource. Second, it means very importantly that not only do people need to trust that what we've placed out in the public is correct and accurate and full, but that we've placed everything out. We're not hiding anything. We don't take down websites. Third, and to me one of the most critical aspects of this, is we have to do this increasingly when our resources are invisible to people. Anyone here who's been in a hospital that has an EPIC installation may have benefited from something that we have called Medline Plus Connect, which means your discharge summary with your personal specific information about how to take care of yourself has in the National Library of Medicine resources embedded in it. It doesn't say anywhere on the top that this came to you from the National Library of Medicine. It doesn't say brought to you by your federal government. But we need to somehow make that clear. These are some of the challenges that I face as we try to foster this distinction we also must support research. Next slide, please. Support research in biomedical and health information access methods and information dissemination strategies like things we've never seen before. Take a look at the second picture from the left. Here you see hovering over a carton of orange juice, the nutritional label. How can augmented reality help us get information into the hands of people at the point of action? How do we figure out ways to bring our resources into a point where they are knowable, understandable, and actionable in a person's life? How does virtual reality fit into this? Where does sound come in? Should we be setting PubMed citations to music? Not yet. But maybe there's ways we could better learn how to convey this, but we are already starting to understand how to, people mentally prepare for learning. And I can tell you this right now, if you're trying to, give, to listen to a podcast of a scientific paper, you're getting about 22% of the content of that paper. And the rest of it is just floating by as the breeze goes with you. That's not a way to sustain science. We have to find some new ways, but we have over-relied on our sense of sight as a way to deliver the National Library of Medicine resources. What will the future hold for us? 
I don't know, but I want to partner to find out, to figure out how to do that. Uh, next slide, please. We want to enhance information delivery. We are very excited to tell you that we have opened something called PubMed Labs, which is our experimental site to find new ways to deliver PubMed information to society. PubMed is used five million times a day. Five million times a day. About um, maybe uh, uh, 25, 30 percent of those are, are computer to computer API interactions. The rest of it is a human sitting at the, at the keyboard typing something in. We've got to make that interface more interesting, more useful, more valuable. If you Google PubMed Labs later on today, you'll get to experiment with our new PubMed Labs. You'll get to see some of our relevance based searching re our re results reporting, which means we, we, we not only can give you your searches based on the sequence, the time sequence of when they were published, recent to more recent to less recent, but also also on using an algorithm very similar to Amazon's, people who bought this also bought that, we can say people who read this also read that. Good or bad? I don't know. I think this is an interesting strategy. I'm a little worried it's going to coalesce knowledge too quickly, but I'm kind of happy it might make knowledge more accessible. More importantly, we need to be able to experiment in ways that give us principled ways to understand and present information. We've started something called snippets. Those of you who have seen a PubMed search recently know that we usually return our information to you in the, as an enumerated list of citations, and we give some, some metadata about the citation, period. Now, when you look at PubMed Labs, you'll see we give two or three lines from, of text from the article, so you may be able to learn faster whether or not this is in there. Why is this important? Because as it's been said around the world, the best place to bury a body is the second page of the Google search results. <laughs> and the best place to bury great knowledge for your research is the second page of your PubMed results. We know that 80% of our users never go to the second page. So we've got to, we, we have to find out a way to either get them to get to that second page or get them to stuff on the first page. We're looking and, and investing heavily in standards. Uh, we've been a big investor in uh, the, the terminological standards for health data already, SNOMED, um, uh, RxNorm, and LOINC, the, the laboratory data. We must continue to invest in standards at the point of care and also at the point of curation for biological data because, frankly, if you call a potato and I call a potato, I'll never find your data. And if I don't understand how you're thinking about this, you won't find mine. So it's part of what we would consider good data hygiene to engage early on in using a use of formal terms. Now, anybody in this room who loves standards, thank you. But most of us don't. I spent, spent my whole career avoiding this area of research. Because why? I couldn't understand why it was important. And now I know it's important, but it still doesn't seem very interesting to me. But what I learned is it's so essential that we have to make it more interesting. We have to make standards fun. That's not going to happen next year, but it will happen soon. Uh, next slide, please. And as I was saying earlier, we have to be able to work in a world where the NLM is inside of the resources. The NLM is embedded. It's not always known. Now, from a political standpoint, this is death to me because I can't go to Congress and say, NLM's inside, it's great. But I have to find ways because it's more important that our resources be used, be accessible, be available to people, and to create the data-driven strategies for the future will require that. Um, next slide, please. We'll move on to our, our third, the third pillar of our future, building a, a workforce for data-driven health and research. Now, you get ready because you're going to hear uh, some same old, same old. Yes, we're going to have more pre-doc and post-doctoral training programs. Yes, we're going to be able to introduce data curriculum to the undergraduates and the kindergartners. Okay, enough of that. Let's go to the cool stuff now. Uh, next slide, please. We have to enhance and expand research training for biomedical informatics and data science. And the important thing here is that we have to think about doing it in a number of different ways. We have to think about taking a mid-career, very successful, kind of happy middle-aged nurse and say, change your thinking. Here's something new to use. Here's how we're going to get you. We have to find ways to bring in the moment knowledge to our investigators who are so busy scrambling for funding, trying to get through tenure, writing papers, leading students, that they don't have time to breathe and we have to say, take a breath and here's some new information for you. We have to find ways to start with our trainees from the very beginning, whether they be biomedical informatics or data science trainees, or our legions of trainees in the T32 programs for the biological sciences across NIH. We have to find a way to start from the beginning to have them think about data science as a complement to and perhaps an alternative to experimental science strategies. 
We have to begin at the beginning with these. The NIH will do this in partnership. We are meeting already to build the core content, the core competencies, excuse me, for T32 training programs, the pre-doc and post-doc training programs that NIH funds around the country. We will start with the core competencies that all PhD and postdoc trainees must have. We did this with ethics 20 years ago. We'll do it with data science now. We also have to build the differentiators. Who, what makes somebody a data scientist? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you think you are one. And if your mother agrees with you, that's terrific. But often that's the only credential people have as data scientists. We need to find out, what does this really mean? What are we getting when we buy a data scientist? What's the skill set? And how many different kinds of data scientists are there? I guarantee you there's as many different kinds of data scientists as there are statisticians. And we're going to need to understand when to bring them together. An important part of our workforce training, uh, very honestly, is to increase the skill set of our program staff at the NIH to understand how to read data science-based proposals. This in itself is a challenge that we've taken on. Um, next slide, please. Assuring data science and open science proficiency is a training activity. Open science doesn't come naturally. As I said, the first sentence is fine. Nobody disagrees that science should be free and open to the society. Second sentence, but not my data. You know, that's not, that's not useful. Institutions, when, we, when we've talked about the setting up of the NIH Commons and I met with different universities, I had more than a couple say to me, oh, we don't need your cloud services, we have our own cloud providers but we need to keep funding our cloud resources for your data science. We have some hard decisions to make in the future of what constitutes open science. Is it voluntary or is it something, is it a fundamental responsibility of a federally funded scientist in the U.S. to commit to an open science and open distribution? And what does it mean to have open science proficiencies? As I indicated earlier, it means thinking, framing, and acting across the research activity in an open science manner. We'll get into clinical practice. I, I presaged a little bit that we're going to be seeing, we see a future where the electronic health record becomes a better substrate for clinical, for clinical based research. But we have to do that in a way that this protects the privacy, not only of the individual patient, but of the clinician. Clinicians should not be exposed to undue scrutiny because we now believe open science is the way to go. These are hard questions. You must help us answer them. Now, increasing workforce diversity. Everyone, next slide please. Everyone, every, every training program, every strategic plan, every vision of the future says we're going to increase diversity. And we're doing fair with this. We're not doing great. I'm going to ask you to think about this with three key components. First of all, plurality of thought. There must be a respect for and an understanding of various traditions of thought that, w that allows our workforce, even if it's not representationally diverse, has plurality of thought. Second, we need to think about diversity not only in terms of having a mix of the same job class, that is having a representation within the same job class of people from different cultures or different ethnic or racial backgrounds, but also the mix across job classes. And we do have to be mindful that as we move towards pathways for diversity, that we must make opportunities at the highest, most um, endowed levels, investigators, scientists, as, as attractive and as feasible as those we make at the more, most mundane levels. The, the clerk, the individual who, who captures data, who types the, the first set of code in. Third, with workforce diversity, we have to think about how do we bring citizens and patients into this workforce? When we speak of workforce diversity, we're often thinking of, well, we, want, we need more academics that might look like me, or maybe look a little different than me, but not too much. We need to think about, as the scientific workforce grows, the population around the world is going to help us with discovery. Citizen science, crowdsourcing, strategies of challenges and hackathons, these are bringing new ways of knowing, and it's time for us to stop treating them as if they're anomalies. Gee, it's nice that you do that. My kids' high school did that, too. And start thinking about how do we leverage that for discovery for the future. Our our responsibilities in d developing a data-powered health environment begin with thinking about the workforce that we need to do that. Next slide, please. We need to engage the next generation and promote data literacy. Engaging the next generation might mean Instagramming with your kids, so get ready. It's not too hard, actually. It doesn't hurt. Uh, but you all, we also need to think about what do they come on already knowing? The 16-year-old that already knows R doesn't need a class in R. How do we keep that young woman interested, engaged, productive in our fields? How do we 
preserve the traditions of the professions, which have a lot to do with an apprenticeship model of training, which have, which have a number of accoutrements that say, first you do this job, then you do that job, and when you get to be the top resident, you do that job, to say, actually, it could be different pathways to the same endpoint. So we need, to, we need to engage the next generation. We need to promote data literacy, what it means to an individual. Now, my little commercial about data literacy is as follows. We consider data literacy as a characteristic of an individual. Right, you are or are not data literate. You do or do not know how to read this kind of article. You can or cannot interpret this. But I want you to think about the way health is experienced in the care between the care. That data literacy is often a family asset, not a person asset. So we don't need to make every person data literate. We need to make sure they have the access to the tools to understand and interpret health information. One of the things we're doing right now to make this possible is we've partnered, next slide please, with our National Network of Libraries of Medicine. We have 6,500 points of presence around the United States, 6,500. We're in almost every county in the country. We are now rolling out at NIH the All of Us program that will bring a million people into a long-term relationship for data collection and will return to those individuals their health information. So imagine your neighbor comes by and says, hey, I got this, um, this uh, sequence, what does it mean? All right, now maybe two of you in the room can answer that, but I couldn't. But what we're doing instead is we're training our librarian participants in the National Network of Libraries of Medicine to be a resource for people to give them the skills and the pathways to understand health information that is returned to them outside of the clinical area. So certainly a conversation with a trusted clinician appears to be an idealized approach to interpreting new information. But in fact, very few people have access to that and very few clinicians are prepared to do that. But librarians are good at connecting people to information. So we're going to take use of that. So, wrap up with what my next steps are. Next, uh, next slide, please. The first and foremost thing that I have to do with my, myself and my leadership team at NLM is to foster a culture of innovation within the National Library of Medicine and beyond. We must replace the sense that people have that the library is venerable and trustable and solid with the library is innovative and ready to move and protects with a purpose for the future. So we, move, we need to move from assuredness, from lifetime career. We have, I, I can't tell you the number of people who have, have been employed at NLM for more than 35 years, and it's really a significant number. And last year I signed a certificate of merit for somebody who's been employed 50 years at the National Library of Medicine. We have a long-standing workforce. We need to move them into a new kind of working. Many of them are ready, some of them are skeptical. Um, we're going to be, we at the National Library of Medicine are in the process of recruiting a data architect because we believe we need someone who is not necessarily a data scientist who thinks deeply about a particular analytic strategy but can think about how do we create the architecture, the people, the infrastructure, the persons, the processes, and the funding to support data-driven discovery. And we'll be expanding our IRP, our intramural research program, scientific investment. This is happening as we speak. I authorized three positions this week in this area. We want to expand our extramural research program to address the challenges of sustainable data science. Um, next slide, please. It's also important for us to gain efficiencies. When you're venerable, you've got a lot of what is sometimes referred to as congealment across the library. That is, things that are a little sluggish and not moving too quickly. So we're doing a couple of things to actually find more robustness. We'll be, we will continue our commitment to outreach, to training, whether it's at NCBI Minute on Tuesday afternoon so you can learn a new technique, or our longstanding program of data science for librarians, or our outreach to communities of color. We will continue this, but we're going to be aligning it better. We're going to be adding in an accountability model. We need to be sure that every nickel we spend on outreach, which is an important nickel to accelerate the use of NLM resources actually has that same impact. We're going to be streamlining our information services, our AV services, and our other internal resources. We have at the National Library of Medicine approximately 332 people whose job title involves something about curation. And they work in nine different divisions, and they work with seven different products. So there's a curator for clinicaltrials.gov, and a curator for dbgap, and a curator for the, the literature. And we're trying to find out, is there anything common across them, or are they really very different fields? And you can imagine, we're still at the point now where, no, 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 they're very different. We need all this. But there's got to be something common so we can accelerate this process. We will be beginning automated indexing, automated indexing first by 2021. 
The National Library of Medicine ingests a million citations a year. Many of them are touched by a human first. We have too long of a delay between the time a citation is released and it appears in PubMed. We need to speed that up. We need to get as good as we can get with automated indexing, preserve our human resources for where they're absolutely essentially needed. Because you know what? Sometimes the articles aren't very clear. Sometimes an investigator calls for study a clinical trial when it's actually not a clinical trial. Some people actually misuse their statistics on a so we have to have our specialists there, but not for every, everything. And we will be learning, as you saw with our, our, um, the ecosystem of data resources, we will need to be linking our literature with data, with models, with, with results, with, with the, the possibility of not just replicating and recreating, but synthesizing across studies at the level of data. Next slide, please. To, in order to get there, we need to get there together. We've got to be accelerating our partnerships with federal agencies, so we work very closely now with NOAA, who are big data like you can't imagine, but their data is kind of well-behaved. It's not like ours. We are working with the National Science Foundation to stimulate investment in, me in methodological research. Partnership with the, um, the math board. Math director is going to yield a, a, an opportunity for funding later this year. We work very closely with the uh, Office of the National Coordinator of Health IT because when we accelerate the use of electronic health records in practice, we need to do it with an eye of eventually seeing them part of the research infrastructure. Well, our partnerships with industry, which is a very new position for the NIH, are really important. We, can, we should not do what industry is already doing, but we must recognize that there are things that industry does for efficiencies that we might be able to do in a new way, in a more effective way, in a more visionary way. So that partnership is important so that we complement rather than duplicate. Academic medical centers are critical partners, particularly when it comes to creating the data infrastructure, locating information, locating data, determining its accessibility. And finally, public libraries are, have, like never before, become a, a critical and important partner. We will be improving our infrastructure. I could regale you with stories of our drippy building, but I won't. Every time there's a flood, though, I get a message that the books are fine, and I think, I don't care about the books, what about the computers? Like, I really do worry a lot more if our computers flood. Books, we figured out how to freeze them and dry them out, but the computers, you can't freeze them. Um, and then we'll be building the 21st century collection. Next slide, please. What does the 21st century collection look like? Well, I want you to think about it looking like three pieces. First, what do we collect and actually hold? Because of our responsibilities, our legislative mandate, we bring things into the library and keep them in perpetuity. We are the library of last resort, the library of record for many journals, books, and we will continue to do that. We also have resources that we connect to. Believe it or not, of those 26 million citations that, they, uh, that are held at PubMed, most of them, the actual full text article that goes along with them is behind a paywall at a publisher. So we connect to that, we can direct you to that, but we recognize the importance of the publishing industry at this point in time. Additionally, as we look to a data-driven future, there will be data repositories that we need to connect to, that we want to preserve the consistent pathway to, that we will never own. Pharma may own them, institutional libraries and universities may own them. So we have to create the directory services that can not only address what we hold, but also what we connect to. And finally, I want you to think about that, that third type of a collection, which is the collection we know about. Either we know about it or we find out about it really fast. When an investigator has a question about environmental exposures, can we know that just yesterday there was a new release of tox information from the EPA? Can we discover a similar data set to one investigator is using that may also be of interest to him? That concept of a library being a pathway to know is a new part of our 21st century collection. It requires that we think about attribution. What does a citation for a data set look like? Do you get tenured if you create cool data sets? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. How do we um, automate curation of data sets? We, we, we can do what we do with the literature in part because we work with the publishers who already have the editorial boards in place, who've already given the imprimatur that this is a good article or this is not one. We don't have the same infrastructure for data, and we're going to have to build that. And finally, we need to think about personalized, and I mean personal to you, and we're going to hear a little bit more about this later on today, personalized presentation of our information and delivery of it. Maybe you like that email that shows up once a week with your favorite, the list of your favorite keywords and the new citations. I, I have, have not found reading to be all that helpful in my busy day, but I would like to have like a really smart graduate student who talk, talk to me every day about what's new in the literature. Maybe we should make the automated graduate student. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, next slide, please. Let me talk a little bit about policies. 
policies we have to we must address we need to carefully look at policies uh, next slide please the first set of policies i want to bring to your attention are policies related to the a collection and this is balancing what does the library collect between the most comprehensive everything that's possible and the most useful and part of what, what it is, is it about selective collection means that we have to maybe ferret out what we sometimes attribute to predatory publishers, journals that might not be at the same level of openness, articles that might have bias in them. That's a challenge for the library, and we will do those decisions in partnership with others. Next slide, please. Second, we need to think about privacy as a very important issue. The libraries don't often think about themselves as, as, as managing the privacy, except the privacy of our patrons. That is, the right to look without being scrutinized. But we, we must think about, as we go to an increasing uh, reliance on data, particularly data that can be re, where in which people can be re-identified, we must think about how do we balance their, our, our, our embracing of an open science model with the risk of inadvertent disclosure. Next slide, please. And finally, our, our experience with our, our researchers. How we understand research has got to make a balance between self-directed exploration for vast electronic resources, and we know every click you make, and the unnecessary scrutiny. We should not expose our investigators. We don't expose our investigators to that now, but we must remain steadfast as a library to preserve the pathway of confidentiality until the investigator is ready to disclose information. Or the 14-year-old kid who wants to find out about whether or not pot is really bad for you. All right, we'll close up with some clinical ap applications, and I'm going to give you an assignment then. The na next slide, please. The National Library of Medicine is going to be giving a future of data-powered health. Let's take a look at what it might look like. Next slide, please. Slide, please. That's NLM inside. All right. What, what what could we get? What are we promising? What do we hope might happen? Next slide, please. Imagine a possible treatment. Or, sorry, planning a screening protocol for a woman with breast cancer. She's 54 years old. She's perimenopausal. She has 20-year history of birth control pill use. She's had three positive secondary relations, has a sedentary lifestyle, and she's had 13 mammograms. How do we make a recommendation for a mammogram? Every year, every two years, we look to the guidelines. The guidelines say, well, maybe not, yes. What could data science do for us? Data mining to, pro to give insight to important relations. Simulation for policy, for capacity planning, for costs, for population demands, and optimization. How do we choose among the thousands of pathways of screening, once every 14 days for six months, once every two years for six years, how do we choose rightly for this person? Right now, we only have an unaided clinical judgment to do that. We need to do more, and we can do more. Next slide, please. Can we target therapies better by using data science strategies? Will data-powered health result if we're able to bring together information about insurance, about cancer, and about a person's preferences? So think of the person with familial adenomatosis polyposis, where we know, we know from, from our early work that noting where the allele occurs is a, a, is a definitive step in deciding whether to do surgery or medicine. But what we don't know is, does this person have insurance coverage? If this person has insurance coverage, what's their preference? What's their assets? Do they have people around them? Can data science help us know that person better in the moment? Next slide, please. Finally, can we optimize medication effectiveness? In the self-management of cancer recovery, people have to take a lot of medications. We're beginning to understand that many different factors influence absorption. Could we know for your person, or your mom, or you, 
how, from metabolomics, from metagenomics, and from circadian rhythms, how your body personally is processing that medication. So we can give, make sure you get it at the right time, or give you a little flexibility if you'd prefer to have an hour or two separate with that. We have the possibility of creating a data-powered health future. The National Library of Medicine will not do it alone. Next slide, please. In order to translate knowledge into health, we need help. And this is where academic medical centers like the University of Cincinnati give us an opportunity. Next slide, please. The role of clinicians here are three things, and I, this is your job. I want you to take home this for conversation with your clinical colleagues. First, they must help us design and deliver care processes that are uncovered through data science. It does no good for an article to report a best practice for cancer treatment or for screening or for managing anxiety and have it sit in a library. It does no good. It must be translated into the realities of the everyday care practices. Secondly, we need to meaningfully engage patients in observation and data capture. And by meaningfully engage them, as you've heard me say before, they're not unpaid data collectors. We need to give them back things. But in order for us to really get the benefit of data-powered health, we've got to have the clinicians help us to translate to patients why it's important that we understand their health better. And finally, we need to have the clinicians participate in public dialogue and policies about patient advocacy, about social good, and about access to care for what we uncover cover through data-driven discoveries and integrate into data-powered health will have to be paid for somehow. And that conversation is both a personal and a social one. Next slide, please. I want you to come with me to a future of data-powered health. We need you to act. We need you to do your work, to work with your clinician colleagues. And next slide, please. And we need you today to go home and provide us with some input on the NIH Data Science Strategic Plan. This was released just yesterday. We have an RFI available. It's a very long RFI. Don't worry about that. Just Google uh, an RFI, NIH, and Strategic Plan, and you will find in the second item, or hopefully not the second page, the second item, the link to the, the, R, the request for information. The Data Science Plan for NIH, if you ask me, goes far, but not far enough. It talks more about managing our legacy data than accelerating our future acquisitions. Your input will be extremely helpful in letting the NIH know how we as the National Library of Medicine. Last slide, please. Thank you very much for your time, for your attention today. I write a blog every week called Musings from the Me Mezzanine. I'm available on email, and I do tweet, and I Instagram some. Thanks an awful lot. We have just a couple minutes for questions. So we're trying to, we want to, so this is where our tension is between 
comprehensive and, and selective. Um, we, we recognize that there are sometimes journals that are new that we don't, and yet we have this literature selection co uh, committee, a federal advisory committee that advises us every year. They review about 300 journals a year for inclusion or for continued inclusion. So we, we're constantly getting advice about this. But we do recognize that there may be journals that, that, that are, are emerging or haven't had two years of publication so that we should pay attention to. So it's actually, I'm finding a little more complicated than I had expected. What I also find is if you choose not to list a journal, the first thing people do is write to Dr. Collins and the secretary and the president. And once that happens, I get them all. And they say, why did you do this? And that, I've been very supported by NIH when we made publication decisions not to list journals. The NIH and, and the secretary's office have been fantastic. But we must be, we must be on top of that pretty quick. Yes? So the question is, how are we going to bring the world along to an open science field? Um, one day at a time. This is part of the answer. Um, and we will be through our partnerships, trying to work with universities to better understand the incentive structure of universities and to be responsive to them. Um, there are, even with our new administration, with the new head of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, um, we are we are finding great support for returning to the public the public defined science and so part of it will be coercion and part of it will be a change of the social value now we, we did, i spent 20 years at wisconsin wisconsin is like way out there in terms of i'm just going to be even on the value of faculty intellect we have the best tech transfer operation in the world our work returns over 80 million dollars to the university every year so the message of wisconsin was if you can Check transfer, no. And so, so there, there are strong and powerful forces working with this, and this requires a larger dialogue about what is the role of a public university in serving the public. Um, and so, I, so I think that conversation is not only about how will we get an investigator to, to embrace open science principles, but how will we um, get uh, how will we get universities to partner with that. We're also looking very closely at the metrics for open science. Right now, the metrics have to do more with deposit. I opened my data up as opposed to use. So we have to find ways to bring some of the, you know, the metrics in place. And we're working with um, the Wellman Trust and um, the University. We, our team, and our open science team is working with them and our, the Office of Science Policy and NIH to begin to apply the metrics so there can be a case made. Because right now it is aspirational. We believe open science is good. We, we do have people who say it might be better to incentivize the economy through other ways. But fundamentally, you know, over and over and over again, there are examples. The more open things are, the more products get built on top of them. So Google Maps, for example, or, or looking at, at, at the way our the way finding the tools that we have. I mean, it's astounding what, what's available. So I'm, I'm optimistic. Yes? So you're looking into having investigators actually Yep. So, so sometimes investigators leave the university and that sentence that's on the Data University's website disappears, right? So, so, what we, so now walk with me through this for just a moment. First and foremost, as of October of last year, October 17th, you can attach a data set to an article of PubMed Central. So we will protect your data in perpetuity. Two, two gigs only, none of those big news things. So we can't do that much. Um, but there, what we, we it's investigator curated. This is our experiment to see investigators Secondly, it's also we we say you must comply with the agreements you made in your it's human data with your human subjects agreements. We don't have an oversight for that yet, so we're watching this. Now, um, the question is, what should the federal what should a federal repository be for investigator generated data, and at what at what point does someone have to pay for that, and who pays for that? So right now, our pay model is going from the institutes and centers. That is, if you're funded by our own blood, our own blood, we can find the finance for it. We're looking into very cold storage in cloud services so that they're very expensive places. The money for data storage is, I mean, the cost isn't the storage. It's 
not putting on the shelf. It's the curation of the directory services, the permits, and keeping the pathway open every time the operating system changes. So, so there, so there we, we have. Um, anybody saw the tape and the data from the 80s? I've got one in my office just to show some people that we actually used to carry this around. Um, there, there is a question of currency. There's a number of policy questions on that. Our responsibility at the, at the National Library of Medicine right now is restricted to PubMed Central. We're working with NIH to, to determine where is the best locus of that responsibility. And in fact, those decisions need to be held at the institute and center level, not at the NRM level. So the policies will come as an NIH policy. Yes? Uh, that is Now, you mentioned the second, another piece which we can handle a lot easier, which is going to investigate and go back in and 
flip their data or pull stuff out because they, they now it's become important. No, our data sets are, are, are deposit only, so you can't write back into our data sets. What we're doing with the cloud instances that we envision happening in, in more common strategy in the future is you will extract, you will be able to extract data sets, sometimes extract synthesizers, but never be able to write back. So you, and then the challenge there is keeping a copy and that copy disappearing, or someone's made a modification on the data set, or they run a different variant call or the genes, and then all of a sudden it looks different than the previous one. So this is this is a piece of, of the logic of working things out. And part of what we're hoping to learn through the Commons Pilots project. Thank you very much for what you're doing. Someday I may benefit from this. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>